Welcome to Sign Up Pizza Man. My name is Enzo, and today we are talking about a pizza documentary called Pizza Shop, an Italian American Dream. Before we get started though, please hit that subscribe button and click on the notification bell so you're notified when I upload new videos. The only one who could ever need me was the son of a pizza man. I recently came across the documentary Pizza Shop, an Italian American Dream and found it so relatable due to the fact that I grew up in my dad's pizza shop and a lot of what was in the documentary resonated with me. I was able to talk to the director of the documentary, Tony Oso, who is also the son of a pizza man. Here's the interview. Coming to America in 1963 on the ship Cristoforo Colom. For the first couple of years, it was me and Fred. It was a little pizza place around the corner. So I called Fred, we got together, and we bought it. Well, when he asked me that, I wanted to hug him. And when we come from, we don't hug too much. <laughs> We have been coming to Rudy's in the last 45 years. I come here at least once a week. This company, Eden, decided to take over the shopping center. So we're here for 43 years. Now you come over, we told him I gotta close. I said, we don't wanna close. And I walk out. The problem is for 50 years, he's been the only game in town. Exactly. So you have three other restaurants coming into the mall. So people are given choices. You know, moving and moving is no, is no good. Pop said today that you're gonna have to be at the restaurant several days a week starting when the new place opens. Probably. But is that possible? For Rudy's, I think the main thing is Charlie and Freddy. It's not Rudy's, it's Charlie and Freddy. After 45 years, I think it's his time for me to, uh, to take it easy, less uh, aggravation and uh, responsibilities. The day of the independent Italian off the boat operator, that, that generation's gone. Your best guess for a year from now, what is your involvement and his involvement and Freddie's involvement? So here we are with uh, Tony Oso, uh, filmmaker and fellow son of a pizza man. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. So uh, today we are talking about your documentary, Pizza Shop, an Italian American dream. So before we get into it, before we actually get into talking about the documentary, maybe we should talk about who you are and kind of like your background and what kind of led you to to do this documentary. Absolutely. So I am first generation Calabrian American. I was born in Jersey. My parents were both born and raised in Calabria, which it was just in the New York Times crossword. It's, it said, you know, how to describe where Calabria is? And the answer was toe. Um, so the very south on the west coast of Italy, which is gorgeous, by the way, um, my parents came from there very poor, undereducated. Um, my father had a third grade education and my mom had a fifth grade education. And um, they married and they came over here and it was just a matter of how do you make a living and how do you provide for a family? So I was, I have an older brother, I'm the second of two boys. and. Um, I grew up in Jersey and I grew up in a pizza shop where I was, you know, often in the way, <laughs> often scooted out of the way. I ended up going to film school and the, my entire kind of life experience came full circle when I made Pizza Shop, which is, as you said, a 57 minute uh, love letter kind of to the pizza business, to the mom and pop shop and to the American dream actually coming true. How did you bring this up to your dad? Like, was he on board at first? Or was he like, what, what are you talking about? What do you want to do? Well, I mean, my father is such a man of um, uh, routine and he does not take to change very well. But we were on vacation with my family in Aruba and my brother showed us like um, 
a short Facebook video of a, like a hundred year old pizza man in Brooklyn, you know, some really old guy who'd been doing it for a long time. But it was only like a two minute, you know, iPhone video. And my father watched it and in passing said to me, oh, you should do something about us like that. And, I, and my first impulse was no, thank you. Because my dad and I really are like, we come from kind of different planets in a way, you know, like there's not a lot of, um, you know, there was always a little bit of friction there. But getting to think about it, I thought that it might actually be really nice. They never did any promotion of the restaurant. They never did any um, ads, commercials, promotional spending. So I said, you know, maybe I'll make something that's elevated, that's not a commercial or not just a puff piece, um, but also not something I'm gonna spend three years shooting. So we ended up with this kind of happy medium. Also because my dad and my uncle who owned the restaurant together were turning 70 and the strip mall was being knocked down completely and rebuilt. So for the first time in their lives, they were being displaced and having to cope with like, we're getting older, this is a turning point in a way, what happens now? So I thought that gave me the opportunity to tell a little more than just you know, that kind of tarantella version of Italian life, you know? He's so funny. He also didn't want, I didn't tell you that my dad tried to cancel the first night of shooting the night before. The first, okay. the first day of shooting. I think, I think I was shooting went to, I think I was shooting on a Thursday morning was the very first day. And on a Tuesday night, my dad was like, I don't think we should do this. I don't know that Freddie's really comfortable. And I literally channeled my mom and I was like, pop, this is a professional crew. They're already hired and we'll be here Thursday at 8.30. Okay, great. And I just pushed through and it was amazing because often I would just get rankled by the fact that he's being such, you know, so annoying. So kind of, you know, nervous or whatever. And he, he and we got there and we shot him waking up, shot him and he was like, should I turn the light off? Should I do this? I'm like, pop, just do what you would do and we're just going to pretend we're not here. So that took a little while because he also um, started narrating everything to the camera. And I was like, no, 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 we can see what you're doing. You don't have to tell us what you're doing, which, you know, was cute. But How long did it actually take to uh, film this? We shot over, I don't even remember. We shot over nine days, I want to say, starting in late 2015. Um, and going into 2016, but it was, I think we did three days and then two days and then two and a half more days or something. It came out, um, you know, the ribbon cutting was one day, which you see at the end of the movie, the forklift sequence when we move the pizza ovens is a, was a Sunday morning. Um, and we shot in Italy actually for a day. I shot, a, you know, in Italy as well. How long were you in Italy? And had you been to Italy before that? I, um, my mother's entire family remained in Italy and my father's entire family came to Bergen County to Jersey. So as soon as we could afford it, basically, we started spending summers in Italy with my mom's family in my mom's hometown, which luckily was on the beach, was is walking distance, like on the beach. So even though I kind of dreaded it as a kid, like an idiot, but now I'm very grateful because I just did the math that I've I spent more than three years of my, you know, growing up life there because we would take long vacations. Um, anyway, so my mom passed away in 2006 and my dad, I often traveled with him when I was going to Italy anyway, I would travel with him. And so I realized that year, which I guess was um, 2016, uh, we, we, um, traveled together and then I reached out to a friend who ran a film festival there and said, do you know a camera person? And can we, you know, do a little shooting really small? So we shot, we actually shot a long interview that I didn't use in the movie. And then we shot him in his, in the little village that he grew up in. And the, as you see in the movie, the um, condemned kind of two story little house that he grew up in with I think four siblings at that point and his parents. And my father's attachment to his homeland 
and those people is very strong um right. to the point that he has no real connection to american culture really at all he never really had a chance i think that he's frozen in a mindset of like i have to work and provide for my family even though everyone's very well provided for and not only that we we have our own careers and make our own livings so it's nice for him to be generous with us and to be thoughtful about us but realistically it's not really like will there be food on the table tonight you know we're not really there and we haven't been there for decades so the question is how do we help him pivot if he's going to pivot if he wants to pivot you know and we talk about it endlessly and we've all kind of you know given up you know and also he has a very strange kind of like i'm going to sell the place and get out and i was like well there are steps you can take between selling it and getting and and retiring or semi retiring but right. i don't um i'll believe it when i see it what what does your how does your uncle freddy um play into this does, does he does he want to retire is is he retired like what so what's his what's his deal so if you can tell in the movie freddy actually is very um loquacious <laughs> he's very friendly he's almost mm -hmm. very muted in the movie because he wanted my dad to take the lead but in real right. life my dad is like a mute and freddy is the class clown and it's a really good combination it was a really good combination. Also, my father loves being shoulder to shoulder with the workers, and Freddie doesn't because he's not crazy. So Freddie likes managing and talking to the customers and having an espresso and being a manager. So they're very different, but they really balanced each other a lot. Um, unfortunately, Freddie was diagnosed with cancer this year, and oh, no. yeah, he he's at seventy two. Um, lung cancer came to get him, so he is kind of retired basically now. He's well right now um, mm -hmm. in terms of being comfortable and functional, but um, you know, it's another difficult issue for all of us because the sadness of, he's such a light in the family. Um, mm -hmm. Also for my father, he was such a partner in um, in the business for so long. So my father, my brothers try to pick up the slack a bit. Um, Freddie's kids are involved in the restaurant too. So it's it's a, it's a been a challenging year, the pandemic. I was hospitalized with COVID, then my grandmother passed at 90. Oh wow, I didn't know that. I think I knew my that. Father's, yeah, my, she's in the movie very briefly speaking in Italian with like an okay. orange pompadour, not pompadour, right, right, right. Move on. Right. Um, she, you know, it's been a tough year on the family. And I said to my father, you know, the longer you work, the more likely you are to work until you literally can't anymore. So I don't think you want that. So again, you know, um, so we're, we're praying for Freddie. I mean, you know, religious people are praying for Freddie. I think about him fondly. I'm, I'm an atheist, but right. um, I, he's always been, a, he's always been the sweetest He's always been really sweet to me and he always teases me when he meets a boyfriend. He's like, are you going to get married? And I was like, I don't think so. And he's like, don't. And um, <laughs> he's like, he's like, don't be stupid. Don't get married. I don't care yeah. if you're a woman. And I'm like, okay, thank you, Fred, for your advice. That's funny. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, you, you definitely get that. You, you get that like that like that sweetness um, from him. I mean, your dad too. Like they, they both seem like like very sweet guys. Uh, um, no, but do you have brothers in your family? Are you? No, nope. are you? I mean, only child. Oh right. Okay. So I have an older brother, and you know, a lot has been said about the first child and versus the second child, and the behavior. So my brother is also in the restaurant business. My father lives with him. They are. They, they're very respectful of each other and tolerant. And I'm like the cuckoo homosexual in the city working in film, even though I'm so not cuckoo by anyone else's standards, I didn't follow right. the path of the restaurant business. Also because I didn't think anyone would take me seriously. When I was young and just coming out and so vulnerable, you know, and I present gay, you know, like I don't, 
it's not really a question if you get to know me, but um, I don't know that I would have, that I felt entitled to take over the restaurant or that I would have been taken seriously. I think, I think that they respect me now, certainly, um, but I don't know that I felt like it was an option. And also my mother was adamant that we get college degrees and do anything but manual labor. Yeah, well, there's there's a point in the in the documentary where you, where you talk about her grabbing you by the ear and yeah, so I mean, so literally, and so literally, I remember it like it was yesterday. I dragged the chair from the dining room up to the dough retarder where the where the marble slab is, and I think it was Maddie, the pizza man, who just left. He had been there for 42 years. He was going to teach me. I was so young though; it was not me learning; it was playing, and right. she was so adamant that we that that we not learn how to make pizza for fear of us getting kind of trapped into it being easy and easy money and i really think it was it's like i say in the movie i really think she's like if you think that i'm going to bust my ass waitressing on you know in these keds for this many years so that you can do a stupid life of manual labor like i had to you are out of your you know, like, not quite to that degree. The idea being like, and the idea not being that manual labor is bad and intellectual pursuits are good, but the, the, the option, having the choice between having to do it or choosing to do it. My brother's in the restaurant business. He's not making pizza. He's, my brother's not making 100 pizzas a night behind the counter. You know what I mean? Like, he's never been there. Right. And I'll never be that person. So your brother, Rick, is also featured. Um, so what is he doing and what, what's his involvement? Also didn't really want to be in it. He's like, oh, it's about pop, you know, whatever. But then it turned out that Rick gives a lot of great context and intelligence to the proceedings in a way that he's much more thoughtfully and less emotionally kind of processing the experience of living with their parents and the business and the immigrant experience, I think. So I got to pull nuggets, like little with gems of wisdom from his footage uh, and use it. And then I told him he came across really well. He was like, yeah, I did. I was like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm kind of awesome. Yeah. He's so uh, funny. How is Rudy's doing these days? Uh, was the move was the move successful? Um, did everything go well in the end? Yeah, the move was successful. Um, as, as the former mayor says in the movie that when they read about the entire shopping center being knocked down people were just like what's happening to rudy's so that was there's a real attachment in the community and you know regardless some people are, are are resistant to change some people are resistant to it being you know now there's a whole foods and there's a target um and maybe it's a little more you know um upscale or mainstream compared to what it used to be with fewer local stores but rudy's is has been doing well there. And I know that my dad was even nervous about the other restaurants coming in, but you know, there's a Bear Burger, there's a Brasserie, like a, a French place, there's a Chipotle. And you know, if you're in the mood for the pizza, you're not gonna go to Chipotle and vice versa. So they, they, were, they remained um, successful. Now, of course, with the pandemic, they're really lucky because they had a really strong takeout business and they always have. So that was tricky um, to negotiate, needless to say, but they stayed open the, through the entire process. You know, I'm in the hospital, uh, you know, things are crazy and um, Kloster, Rudy's Kloster stayed open the whole time. You know, it's not doing great because people are loath to go out. And also the clientele at movies is certainly family and it skews a little older and a little family -er. more families and stuff. So not necessarily people who are risking it as much. So I think right, that right. as the, you know, hopefully knock on wood in the next few months, it'll come back. And then I think there'll be a real surge, uh, like in many places that people are really desperate to go out and revisit yeah. their favorite places. You know? Oh, the, so the quote, um, that your dad says at the beginning of the, the documentary. Yeah. Yeah, the owner makes the horse fat. And then and then your your grandfather says it. 
Incidentally, I would never have fed him that. I mean, I guess maybe I would have if I had thought of it, but those two conversations did not happen close together. And when he said it, I turned to Laura, my producer, who shot some of it as well, because um, she's a shooter and a photographer as well. And we were like, oh my God, can you believe he said that? Um, do you know what it means? A lot of people said they didn't understand what it means. I've I've never heard it. And I was trying to, I was earlier, I was like, okay, what, what does this mean? Um, and I was like, I, I don't know. Uh, so what what does it mean? So the saying is, L'occhio del padrone fa ingrassare il cavallo, I think, which means literally the eye of the owner fattens up the horse. Or, or the calf or whatever. I think it means that there's no attention like the attention of the owner that can help something thrive. So if you're trying to fatten up a calf for slaughter, no one's going to feed it and treat it the right way to get it as fat as possible, the, like the owner, you know? Right, right. Um, so the it's kind of like the opposite of a watched pot never boils. It's kind of like, if you like no employee or person besides the owner is going to care about it and nurture it like the owner will. So yeah. that's what it means. The eye of the boss, the, the, the watchfulness of the person who's most, you know, um, responsible or whatever. It's his <laughs> own, I mean, it's the credo of his own life, which is the point right. of, which is why you say to him, you had so many great employees who have been there for decades. Why not make so-and-so a manager and take, you know, more time off? As much as he loves them and treats and, and treats them like family, he's just like, they're not me. Right. You know, which is, which I think comes out of a deep fear from, from, you know, the thing that we don't know, you and I, that, that they know is poverty. You know, I think I can't speak for your dad, but my dad grew up really in abject, like slept on a mat on the floor with no heat with his brother, had an out, dug a hole, didn't even have an outhouse. Like it was a hole in the ground. And that was right. until he was, you know, 15. He loves to say that he didn't have a Coca-Cola till he was 18 years old. You know, like he really grew up knowing what it meant to have nothing. And as much as he right. talks about how great it was, he also is not dying to go back. Having six other uh, siblings is that's that's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot of lot of kids, especially when you're when you're you know trying to just scrape by. Yeah. I'll never know my father. My father, my my father's mother was so young when she had him, and then she had two kids right away after him. And immediately he was co-parenting, kind of, you know. So it's not something that I can imagine. So I focused right. on Aunt Antonietta and Dorina, my two right. aunts. And you remember them briefly, because there's the, Antoinette's very Jersey and very made up, and then Doreen's very normal, or like, right, you know, right, right. And Doreen's kind of the hippie in the family, natural look. And they are sisters, and so they're, so my father's the first, Freddie's the second, Antoinette's the third, and then Doreen's fifth. But since Doreen and Antoinette also grew up in the restaurant business and own restaurants themselves, I thought that their input about their childhood especially would be valuable. And so okay. I wanted to hear from their point of view. And often, you know, I mean, Doreen mentions seeing a toilet and watching a toilet swirl for the first time when she flushed it. And right. I, didn't, I didn't get that detail from my dad or Freddie, but to think about being eight or 10 or 12 and seeing a toilet flush for the first time, I thought was so, you know, relatable or something. So I really, I was glad that I brought them in and just said, yeah. you know, tell me what you remember. Dorina just, Dorina uh, and her husband uh, owned a restaurant. He just retired, she's still working there. And Antonietta is retired, but she and her husband Franco ran a restaurant pizzeria nearby for years. She's, uh, she's retired like a smart person and being enjoying being a grandmother and her son took over her place but they all had similar experiences you know and the restaurants were yeah. all similar in terms of style and they're all like 
15 or 20 minutes apart from each other. My father worked in a bakery in Hell's Kitchen in New York City, and then he worked in his uncle's pizzeria in Hell's Kitchen, and they kept getting broken into, and the cigarette machine kept getting smashed, and my father was like, had a young, had my brother, and he was like, get me out of this. You know, which is part of why my father thinks I'm crazy for living in the East Village. But I, I, I try to tell him that the city is not like it was in the late 60s. So um, once he got the job to be a pizza man at Rudy's, working for Rudy, that was it. Then he brought his brother in. Then Franco bought a pizzeria that already existed in Fort Lee. And then two other brothers opened, you know, like opened another place. It just became like the family business. Right. right. You know, and you share a lot of, uh, you can't deny that you share a lot of insider knowledge and kind of, I think, you know, I mean, I know that, I know that they still call and they're like, I need a pizza guy. Do you got a pizza guy? Do you have me a pizza guy? You know, you know, so I think or, it's really anyone, I mean, it's not an easy business as you know, but mm -hmm. I think that it's kind of like barbers or I don't know laundromats like people always need clean clothes and a haircut and pizza right? so where can people watch pizza shop so pizza shop is available to stream on amazon prime where if you have a membership you can stream it for free you can also um rent it or buy it on um, Google Play, Tubi. So Tubi is a site where you sign up and it shows you commercials in between, but you can watch it for free. Um, I haven't watched it with commercials because I hate to wonder. I hate trying. I don't want to see where they decide to chop it up. Um, right. And you can watch it on, on um, YouTube and uh, Vimeo On Demand is my personal favorite. Not only because they don't take as much money away from me if you decide to spend the money on it. But what I really want to tell people is if you have Italian relatives who might enjoy it, there's an Italian subtitled version on Vimeo that if you buy oh, the nice. on Vimeo, you can also watch the Italian subtitled version. And we don't really, we didn't really talk about this, but I made a group of shorts in the build up to making pizza shop that were like little promotional internet things about the restaurant and they're in there too. So you can watch inside Rudy's six little, you know, 90 second to two minute pieces. Um, because I do know that Italian pe Italian speakers want to watch it. So you can only, I think you can only watch it with Italian subtitles through Vimeo on demand. That being said, most people are watching it on Amazon. It's 57 minutes. And the thing that people tell me about it most that surprises them, not only that, you know, it's it's the food looks delicious and oh, I want pizza now, but people generally speaking are, are surprised at how emotional it is or how moving it is. Cause you think you're gonna get like kind of a, you know, surfacey story. Like an operational kind of Thing. Yeah, like you're gonna get like a like something that's just kind of promotional, you know? Right. And this I tried to go a little deeper without, you know, the budget to really do like a multi year kind of thing. So that's why to me making it under an hour and making it, you know, there's some heart to it, but it's not, you know, the ins and outs of every day or whatever. Well, I I highly, highly, highly recommend it. So um thank, thank you, you for taking the much. time to uh, talk okay. about it and uh, yeah, I should check it out. My pleasure, thank you. Yes, you can go to Pizza Shop Movie too. You can follow the restaurant at Rudy's Pizza Closter on Instagram. If you're ever in Northern New Jersey, stop by, tell Charlie I sent you or uh, watch the movie <laughs> and then uh, you'll recognize him. He'll probably give you a free Rudy's baseball cup. There you go. Free I mean, not to, not to, you know, not to try to get people to watch the movie in exchange for swag but you know it's a baseball cap yeah um i, yeah. I take it exactly thank you so much for having me enzo yeah thanks for thanks for talking again i would highly recommend checking this documentary out you can go to pizzashopmovie.com for more information if you have seen this or will, will be watching it let me know in the comments below thanks for watching as always if you like this video please hit that like button and don't forget to subscribe to the channel also remember to follow me on instagram twitter and facebook until next time ciao
for now.